All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 21st day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. And Windows has struck again. I've just spent uh, 15 or 20 minutes trying to resort things out here. My main display had been reduced to, to HD from 4K, which means everything screwed up. Uh, the OBS software wasn't working. Everything, resolutions were always off on everything. Everything was messed up. Yes, thank you, Bill Gates. Windows has sucked from the beginning. And I date predate Windows. I remember uh, when that came out, I was selling computers and customer call up or something or, or repairing them and they'd say well i'd ask him are you running windows and they said yes take it off <laughs> go back to dos yes windows was awful and it's still awful why can't they stop upgrading it and stop changing things because they just make it worse <sighs> and every time that it's just oh what a mess they just create more errors that's a, a problem that the system's way too complex. You can't get the bugs out of it. That's why the F35 and the F22 are junk. Very expensive junk. You can't get the bugs out of it. Wait for the Russians to put bugs in. The experts in electronic warfare. They can probably bring those things down without even touching them. In fact, I think they there's reports they may have done that occasionally. Well, what was the F22? I can remember that they had some a major problem with it because they were flying across the Pacific. They crossed the international dateline and nothing worked anymore. Oops. Computers should not be put in positions where human life depends on them. Oh, they're not reliable enough for that. Uh, it's like the cars. You're much better off with the old mechanical stuff. Uh, it's simply... Get around the problems. Electronics is not a... High-tech is not a solution uh, to anything, really. It is just... Uh, it, even, although it's enabled us to communicate much more broadly, if you look at the quality of what's generally on YouTube and social media, it is a plague. Far worse than COVID-19. <laughs> a plague. A plague. So I want to talk about something that's come up twice at the church I've been attending, which is a uh, Fundamentals Independent Baptist Church. Uh, the best I can find in the area. Uh, there's, yeah, it's the best I can find. And uh, I don't have a lot of serious complaints, but some of the things, I, I, this is not just particularly about them. But let me say, first of all, about Fundamentals Independent Baptist, of, of churches that claim to be biblical, they are probably at the top of the list. However, however, uh, there's also a background in that movement that was strongly influenced by revivalism, and revivalism has nothing to do with sound doctrine. And they have some other things, internal contradictions. As we all have, have you noticed that you you have contradictions with your, in yourself? The the spirit and, and uh, the older I get, the more I realize it's that Scripture, when it talks about the spirit and the and the flesh, uh, being at odds with one another, Paul writes about that. Yeah, if you understand that, <laughs> then things are a little easier. And over a number of years, you eventually come to understand that. And I real that's my flesh. I don't have to worry about my flesh. It's not coming with me. It's just temporary. All right, when I leave this world, one way or the other, it's not coming with me. 
A new bodily resurrection, but not the same old body. Okay. Now, uh, what I want to talk about is that twice in the last month, the fundamentals independent Baptists, their music has always pretty much sucked. Okay. It is tend to be the revivalistic, popular. It's a CCM, it's always been a plague. Contemporary. What was con uh, uh, Fanny and yeah, the more I look at that from a biblical perspective, what I always thought was great is now like the theology is bad. It's self-centered. You know, like humanity is, uh, and look at evangelicalism. It is utterly self-centered today. It's all about me and what God can do for me. It's like, wait a minute, isn't he the center of all things? If, if there's one thing right about Calvinism, it tends to put the center on God, except Calvinism is utterly inconsistent too and doesn't do that uh, reliably. But yeah, I think that's why some people were attracted to it. It claims to be God-centered. <sighs> it's really theology-centered, but bad the the theology. And uh, yeah, their God, their God, the God of their theology, I should say, not necessarily every Calvinist, is not the God of the Bible. So, uh, which is the not so much a problem with independent fundamental Baptists because they're more biblically oriented. They they do not have sets of theology books usually if they do it's like yeah uh, it does not help you you it, you contaminate yourself with the opinions of people that you probably shouldn't be listening to <sighs> and then it takes you a long time to sort through it then you realize i should have never read that junk to start with okay but it does help me when it comes to maybe communicating to people that are younger than I or haven't known the Lord as long as I have or just have been wallowing in the cesspools that are out there in uh, modern Christianity that uh, say, no, this, I've been there, done that, bad idea. Okay? Uh, just like my idea on use of uh, drugs, uh, mind-altering drugs. Been there, done there, bad, done that, bad, 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 bad idea. Uh, no, but what I want to talk about, let's, let's first go to the scripture and I'll set the context. It has to do with what broadly we call CCM today, uh, contemporary Christian music, uh, whatever form, uh, hymns, I'm not even talking about the, the junk, but the, the hymnal, the hymn, hymn style contemporary Christian music, uh, and not the contemporary Christian music as far as the industry, but rather uh, you know, with the payola and everything else is probably going on there too. But the rather, and all the homosexuality that's reported to be rampant among uh, that industry, but rather uh, the better aspect, maybe the kind of stuff that could leak into a fundamentalist uh, Baptist church. But let's go first to scripture. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, I finally got the settings back where it's supposed to be. Except if you're seeing something that looks a little odd, why is that? Oh, there, there it goes. Uh, this is Jesus Christ in John chapter 4, starting at verse 23. This is uh, Jesus' encounter with the, the woman at the well. Now, why did he go by the way of Samaritans through Samaria? Jews didn't go that way. That, that is the high road, where Jews would always take the low roads, either along the uh, Mediterranean coastline or the, uh, the Jordan Valley, because they didn't want to go through the territory of the uh, Samaritans, uh, which was more Israel proper. And then north of that was Galilee. See, the territory of, the Samar of Samaria was between Judea and Galilee. And J Jesus and his disciples were based in Galilee, on the north side of the of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so here Jesus is saying, on this, he, he has this encounter with the uh, the Samaritan woman. He says, but the uh, the question was, where should we worship? The, you Jews say we're supposed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. We Samaritans, we have our own temple. Uh, we say we're supposed to worship there. What do you say, since you're a prophet? But the hour is coming, and now is, 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, that's what I want to talk about. How are we supposed to worship in spirit and in truth when we're supposed to sing garbage, theological, false, unbiblical garbage that would get you burned at the stake throughout most of Christian history? I mean, terrible theology. The, the Christians, we've always struggled with the idea of the Trinity. One God, three persons. And I put the word persons in quote because the English idea of person, the modern idea of person, uh, is not the historic idea. And it's not simply a mask, you know, like the the uh, the, the Unitarians uh, and the oneness Pentecostals. They think, well, God just, you know, it's one God. He just changes this way and this way and this way, which is really, really bad theology. But no, the Bible is very clear God is one, and he's also uh, has three subsistences <laughs> that we generally refer to as persons because they have characteristics of personality, except not individual. They're not individuals as separate individuals. That's where it gets complicated. How do you express that? Because it's not like, you know, it's not like a family or anything like that. And there's some people like... Uh, what was it, uh, um, William Lane Craig, that and some others have talked and flirted. I think with you talking about Craig, he's a philosopher, so he flirts with ideas. Flirted with the ideas well, like a social Trinitarianism. It's really three gods in close society. No, no, no. That's tritheism. That, that'll put you with uh, the Mormons, sort of. They just have more gods. Or the Hindus. Uh, no, you can't do that. There's all kinds of, of reasons you can't, other than the Bible explicitly says no. I am one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. And that doesn't mean one as in, uh, no, it means one, period. It doesn't mean one as in a sense of a common mind or something. No! One. But he also has is, is uses a, the plural about himself. So that's why we have the idea of three persons. And we have the Father, the Son, or in the Old Testament, the Word. And uh, the Son is also explicitly referred to in the Old Testament, like in Psalm 2. Uh, but also the Holy Spirit. And they're all God. They can't be separated as separate, per, uh, separate individuals. Uh, with separate wills and separate minds. and No, you can't do that. Separate essences. You can't do that. You can't divide God up into three beings. There's only one God. When it comes to Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate in flesh, we have God, Jesus called himself the Son of God, but more often he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Okay, so we have a, which is, Utterly foreign to classical theism, by the way, because God can't change, and here you have God becoming a man. No, that to see the Christian God is different than the theological God. It just doesn't work. Aristotle didn't have a clue. Uh, he denied the revelation that God gave him and decided he knows better. And that's what the basis of traditional Christian theology is: is Aristotle's ideas of God. Bad, 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 bad. Now, most don't know that, but when you compare them, yeah. See, I, I actually check sources. Aha! Uh -huh. That gets me in trouble. Well, like this. I'm not a member of this church, by the way. I don't really feel comfortable necessarily confronting this pastor about it. I was thinking, well, what, can I pass him a note, maybe? But, you know, a pastor doesn't like being questioned. <laughs> Is it worth it? I'm just hoping perhaps, well, this is the problem all over, so that's why I'm doing this video. But we're supposed to worship in spirit and in truth, right? Well, what does that mean? Uh, wrong thing. <laughs> spirit and in truth, the Holy, according to the Spirit of God, 
and in truth, because God is truth. Can you worship that's something that's not true? With Can you sing things that are not biblically true, contrary to historic Christian theology? The good stuff, not the bad stuff. No, you can't worship God in error, in falsehood. You can't worship... the new. I like the way the New King James, or the King James says, it talks about will worship. Worshiping according to your own will rather than according to what uh, God uh, says. And that was another relatively good thing about Calvinism, although you can take this way too far. The idea of the regulative principle of worship, we should worship according to what God tells us how to worship in Scripture. Problem is, they confuse the Old Testament and the New. Jesus is saying here, see, Jesus right here makes a, is utterly cutting off Old Testament worship from the kind of worship God wants. God says, Jesus said they'll worship not, not in the temple in Jerusalem according to the law, but in spirit and in truth. This is the new creation, the new birth. You must be born again, the spirit of God in you. Uh, you. You worship God directly, not through rituals and symbols and types and shadows, not through animal sacrifices that can't remove sin, but the one sacrifice of Christ that removed your sin. So you don't have to approach God with all these, these offerings and everything. You can just come to him directly because you're, it's all been paid in full on the cross. So, so we're supposed to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, this is a problem I've run into several times now. Now, this is not just this song, um, but this is an example of atrocious music. Way too many of the hymns in the hymn books were written by not Orthodox people. Some of them pastors, like Wesley. you got to be a little careful with Wesley, John Wesley. Uh, Charles Wesley, uh, he's, he's, Charles, uh, Wesley's, John Wesley's brother Charles wrote quite a few hymns. But they had some atrocious theology. At times, really bad. Like you have to stand in your own righteousness and the Christian perfectionism. The, the uh, no, that that's where the that's where the uh, the holiness movement got it from. It was from Wesley. He was the father of that. Uh, no, that was. I mean, people throughout Christian history have strived for sinless perfection, but none of them claim to have actually ever achieved it. It's like the people that went into the desert uh, and sat on a pillar for 40 years in order to, or into a cave and became hermits in order to, to escape from the corruptions of the world, the flesh and the devil. Well, what did they find out? Well, they might have gotten away from civilization, but the flesh and the devil were still there. And they found, often found out they were worse off than they were before. Uh, and then they try to resist in their own power. It's like, no, this is a lost cause. Those, the desert fathers are not something you want to talk uh, follow. This goes back in the like the uh, third and fourth century and things like that. And you got Augustine coming in with monasticism and all kinds of bad ideas about marital sex and that it's always sinful. That's a wicked man. Augustine was a he had a. He was projecting his own sexual immorality on things, and he was looking for something to blame it on uh, and trying to get probe into things that the Bible did not explain, uh, which brings up another sex thing I want to talk about first. I really wanted to tell the pastor last, uh, well, this last Sunday, and no, Sunday before, but especially Sunday before, a difficult text, in other words, an unclear scripture, something that's apt to cause confusion, does not make for a good sermon. <laughs> no! <laughs> Emphasize what is clear. That's one of the, the rules of biblical interpretation that you should always follow. Interpret the difficult in light of the clear. So what the Scripture clearly teaches, like Paul clearly teaches about the new covenant, and salvation, all these things, that is the framework we have to fit everything in. And he, the pastor's been going through 1 John which can be a difficult thing if you don't keep it in this framework, because what, what John is writing about is how does a person know that they're actually saved rather than just deceive themselves or been deceived by a bad preacher that says, if you do this and this and this, you're a Christian. 
Oh, I got baptized. I went to communion. I, I went through the communion, you know, like, like what I was raised with. Was I a Christian? No. <laughs> I was not. I was not a New Testament Christian, someone who has been born again, convicted of my sins and, and born again the Holy Spirit, realized that Christ paid for all my sins. I have a different relationship with him because there's a different spirit in me now. <sighs> The flesh hasn't changed, though. <laughs> Just got older. But uh, a bad text, that's one of the problems with going through verse by verse. Oh, this, this man tends to go through several verses, or he'll go through a chunk, and then he goes back and breaks it down even farther. That is not good, I don't think, because these were written as letters, epistles, not meant to be exegeted verse by verse. I think churches nowadays, especially Protestants, spend way too much time on sermons. They spend more time simply reading the scripture publicly, not preaching about it in, you know, oh, well, this week I've got to go through these three verses here, which is about what he does, uh, which is better than one, but simply because someone told you that that's how you're supposed to do it doesn't mean God told you that's what you're supposed to do. These, are, these have to be read in bigger chunks in order to make sense of them anyway. And it's, it's really hard for, I don't know if it's, if it's simply because of our soundbite age and our short attention spans or just generally disintegration of human reasoning but we can't, it's difficult to keep everything in mind, that the, the large framework, and then fit the pieces in there. We get too focused on the piece. Especially when you have to do a 40-minute sermon on a piece. Uh, sometimes, skip over things. You're better, you're better skipping the difficult or explain it in terms of the larger picture, knowing that it's going to cause people difficulty. It's like... Uh, like in John, now this pastor has been pretty good about going to the Greek when it, it, to, it when it says uh, we know that uh, no one who is uh, born of of God sins. Now he didn't like the last sermon. He was not quite clear whether he was talking about. He actually thought that was referring to Jesus Christ, but that's not what the text says. Problem is, I'll pick up on that stuff. It, it creates misery for me because it's like, that's not right. And I'll look at my wife and go, hmm. <laughs> it's like, nobody else understands, but it's most people don't think, is this biblical or not? We simply don't you, uh, tend to do that. Uh, it makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, go with the flow. No, no, no. Go against the flow. The flow's going the wrong way. The flow's going to hell. It's going downhill. And this, uh, the problem with that, uh, yeah, you, you need to uh, uh, not spend a whole lot of time on a difficult text. Just explain the difficulty and just say, don't worry about that. Go by what's what we know for sure. There are texts in the Bible we simply don't know enough about it. Because they were written to a particular congregation at a particular time, and we really don't know what was going on there. And if you try to read details in that aren't there, well, you don't know enough to do that. <laughs> Nobody does, except God himself. So uh, let's go to, but this is a problem. The music they've introduced, they do do like one contemporary, relatively conservative Christian thing a week and this song has appeared and I usually don't uh, I don't like that because they're not in the hymnals so I can't look at the words ahead of time they're on the projector I do not like projectors for that reason in other words also because when they screw up then everybody sits around sucking their thumb until somebody figures out what to do unless you got a big mouth like me and say how about using the hymnal 
Look one up in the book. Well, you're, st you're standing up there with dead air time in the church for, for like 60 seconds. And nobody seems to know what to do because the projector's not working. Here's a clue. Use the hard copy. Pick one. Pick a good one that everybody knows. What's this deal with having to sing hymns that no, or songs that nobody knows? It's so the problem with the Baptist hymnals. They've got, they're not so much a hymnal. They're a songbook. Yeah, you know, a, a hymn that's been sung for a thousand years, there might be a reason it's still in hymn, hymnals today. There are a lot of hymnals, hymns that are not sung. But also it gives you a little continuity with the past. You realize that Christianity wasn't invented a hundred years ago. Here's a problem. Chris Anderson is the uh, the author of this. Um, I tried looking him up. Apparently, he's not like a big name thing, and he's not doesn't seem to be trying to make money off this so much. The problem is with uh, CCM is it's written now. It's probably created by AI <laughs> because the idea is to create what will appeal to people, and AI would be perfect for that. AI doesn't have a concept of truth, but yeah, since it doesn't have a spirit and a soul, it just models itself after fallen human beings. Or that's what it's modeled after, largely. Oh my. To, to inquire of the AI God. What a what talk about idolatry. Talk about cutting down a tree and using half of it to cook your lunch and using the other half to carve an idol and then bowing down and worship your idol you made. That's AI. We're going that way. Right out of the book of Revelation, an image that has uh, the power to speak and has authority to kill you. Not good. Not good. Uh, you know, right, already it's being used on Wall Street, it's being used in politics, it's being used everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and so you got to be even more careful because be, uh, you can you can t ask it. I I understand. I hear to create a song of a certain genre, and it will do it. Well, what does it do? Uh, AI uses fuzzy logic, so it it looks at patterns, and so it basically it it analyzes has all this knowledge, so called, of patterns of music, of particular genres and words and themes and. And it does not real knowledge, but it's simply algorithmic patterns uh, like, you know, a fly would have in his brain, just just a neural network. And it'll create one. It'll probably be pretty good because it's designed, it's patterned after what people create. Good enough compared to, uh, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Boy, you wouldn't even need AI for that. Dumb. People are so dumb. The fall. We don't even question these things. Oh, it makes me feel good. That's the other problem with modern music. It's not designed to stimulate your mind and your spirit. It's designed to stimulate your flesh, which is where your emotions reside, largely. The flesh. Because emotions are changeable. God doesn't change. So if you if you're trying, then that's where the revivalism as a tradition uh, comes in and causes a lot of problems for Baptists and others. Methodists, they were big in revivalism, and the Holiness movement, of course, is Methodist largely. Uh, there are some other branches, but they're here. So here's this uh, Chris Anderson's music. And it, this, is, this might sound like nitpicking, but it's not. Because th this is the problem. You've got something that is basically sounds very good. So uh, here is uh, the lyrics. I'm not going to try to sing it. His Robes for Mine. That's the title of it. And you know, the, the Christ in righteousness that's given to us as a gift, very biblical. Some of this is very biblical.
but I can recognize certain parts that he's been drinking from Calvinist waters. <laughs> People like, uh, uh, what is it, Paul Washer. I, some expressions in here sound like they come straight out of Paul Washer. I'm not sure where, if they were original with Paul Washer or probably not. His robes for mine. Oh, wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Not true. Nowhere, nowhere in the scriptural, scripture does it ever say that God poured out his wrath on Christ. Christ died under the law, experiencing the penalty of the law for sin. When we talk about God's rage being poured out on Christ, it's a denial of what Scripture teaches. Jesus put the basis of the atonement in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to save the world, to save sinners. Not just there. You know, Paul says that it's a certainty that Christ came into the world to save sinners. So it was God's love that put Christ on the cross. And Christ's love that put Christ on the cross. And God didn't pour out his wrath. The, 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 where it talks about, well, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Might talk about that a little bit. But he's quoting from a psalm. Jesus on the cross is quoting those words from a psalm. So let's remember the it don't come up with an explanation that is in odds with the scripture's teachings. His robes are mine, clothed in my sin. Well, no, not exactly clothed in it. You are sin. That's a problem. You were sin. Say, sin is not a thing we wear. Sin is what we are, as far as being a rebel against God. Uh Christ suffered neath God's rage. False. Biblically false. This is uh, when you, people reading things in that aren't there. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. The idea here is generally correct. You know, we are given a righteousness that's not our own. We are considered righteous because we believe in Christ. Christ is our righteousness. In fact, that's an Old Testament name for Christ. Yatsikeno. God our righteousness. I probably got the pronunciation really bad, but you know, uh, uh, Christ our salvation, Jesus, Yeshua. Christ our salvation or Christ saves. Uh, God our salvation or God is a savior or God saves or however you want to render that. Uh, but the other name that he said that he shall be called Gatsikeno, Christ, our God, our righteousness. So yes, but it's not God's rage. It's the wrath of the law. Where there is no law, neither is there sin, says the scriptures. God's anger, Romans chapter 1, is directed at those who refuse his revelation and refuse his salvation. John 3.36. The wrath of God abides on those who uh, refuse to believe. I think that's probably the best way to render that. Not just not believe, uh, not ignorance, but rather refusal to believe the revelation God has given them. And God has given everyone revelation about God's existence, for example. And what happens? Sinful men and women refuse it and try to suppress it, uh, including science has become a tool of suppression of truth, like the theory of evolution, co modern cosmology. It's like, no, this is suppressing the truth. You, come up, you have to come up with ways that exclude God from the picture, make God unnecessary, and that shows you the true nature of scientists. They are rebels against God in general, and if you don't go with the narrative that they come up with, well, you won't get funding. 
or you'll lose your job. Uh, you won't be hired. No, I don't believe that garbage. I believe what God said. <laughs> and you'll be caught, uh, considered an ignorant fool. Well, they crucified Christ. He said, don't be surprised. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. True. Uh, draped in his right... Yeah, so some of this is true, but beneath God's rage. No, it gets worse, though. The ver uh, Verse 2, his robes were mine. What cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Correct. See, it's not God's wrath, it's God's law that's the pro it's a problem for sinners. God loves, to, God wants to save sinners. As Paul says, though, Christ died that God might both be just, upholding the penalty of the law, but also be able to justify sinners. How do you justify a sinner? You can't do it without the cross. You can't simply, God can't simply pardon sin. He said the wages of sin is death. What's he going to do? Annul his own law? What do you have to do? He had to take the law out of the way. As Christ said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Do you understand the meaning of that now? Not to annul the law, but to satisfy the just requirement of the law, and thereby taking it off the table for those who trust in Christ. No longer are they under the law, but they've died with him. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine. Absolutely true. See, a lot of this is good. It's not our righteousness about him. If you trust in your own righteousness, you're going to hell. Because it's not good enough. And you've rejected Christ. You've rejected his righteousness and what he did on the cross. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. True. Most people wouldn't say life. So that's why I think there's a definite Calvinist uh, influence here. But yes, Christ had to live a perfect life under the law. Uh, and his, our righteousness, it's not Christ's works that are imputed to us. It's Christ's life that's imputed to us. His righteousness. His, we are united with him. In him we are saved. In him we have eternal life. A person, not simply his works. Of course, he had to do these things, but... It is Christ. God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And God, as a man, hung on the cross. It was the man, Christ Jesus, the human part of him that cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The, and th I want to get into that right now. The chorus. Now, this is the worst. Let me, let me before I get the chorus, let's look at verse 3. His robes were mine. God's justice is appeased. Okay, Jesus is crushed, and thus this Father pleased. Yeah, uh, Matthew, uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Christ drank God's wrath on sin and cried, that sounds like Paul Washer, tis done. Not really. The law is, demands death for sin. The law of the garden. The day you eat of that tree, you'll die. If God had not said that, Adam would not have died. There would have been no sin. But God brought in law. Sin's wage is paid. True. Propitiation won. True. It was won on the cross. And the resurrection proved that God, the Christ's work was accomplished. Otherwise, he couldn't have raised, been raised from the dead. Say, if you think Jesus, well, there's a whole lot of people out there today, polls have demonstrated, they think Jesus sinned. Christians that can't believe Jesus sinned. Well, then you don't believe in Christ. And you have no salvation because it's impossible. If Christ didn't, uh, if, if he had sinned, he couldn't have been an atonement for you. And he would not have been able to rise from the dead. If he had not atoned for the sins of the world, he would not have been able to arise. If he bore the sins of the world, 
and had not accomplished full payment for that, he would not have been able to rise from the dead. Yeah, uh, yeah, the drank God's wrath. That's a Paul Washerism. I've heard that from Washer so many times. Washer is an extremist. Uh, uh, he is no. He's he's almost holiness. I mean, he's so extreme. If Christ paid for your sins, they're paid in full. You don't have to be concerned that much about it. You don't. Now, if you love sin, then you have to be concerned because then you might not be born again. But, but you ought not be able to 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 be obsessed with those things. If you're obsessed with it, there's something wrong. Because Christ paid for it. It's accomplished, finished. It was finished 2,000 years ago. Okay, um, I'm going to, let's see, last verse. His robes were mine, such anguish none can know. Christ, God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. Uh, yeah, it's like the, what I have to do is sometimes with the pastor, when I, I gotta give him some time and then say, yeah, I sort of get what he's trying to say. He's just not doing it very clearly. Uh, and I can sometimes tell that he doesn't quite understand what he's talking about because he struggles. He'll, he'll say something and talk about it, and then he goes back and later and says something else that contradicts it in order to, to uh, counterbalance what he said, which is sort of a sign you're not properly understanding what you're saying because God doesn't have... You know, you talk about tension in God. There's no tension in God. That would be a problem. He, uh, as though I, accursed and left alone. Uh, okay. Accursed by what? The law. Under the curse of the law. The penalty of the curse of the law is death. The wages of sin is death. That's the curse of the law. So the father was just walked away? Really? How could he do that? That's the real problem. I, as th uh, though he embraced and welcomed home. Uh, yeah, no. Okay, here's the real problem. Okay, the chorus. So you have to sing this four times. You're being indoctrinated into washerism. Uh, uh, washer is Calvinism. Paul Washer. No, you will not hear much about God's grace from Paul Washer. Uh, he likes to convict people. Well, I don't know. That was before his heart attack. Sometimes God has a way of adjusting people's attitudes. Now, uh, Paul Washer is, uh, yeah, there can be excessive grace, you know, unregenerate people, and they claim they've got God's grace. Well, that's what Rome John uh, chapter, uh, 1 John is about. Do you really have God's grace? Are you really, do you really have eternal life? Yeah, and there's methods. How, how do you know? Well, you love the brethren. That's probably the major one. Do you love people that are born again? You truly love them. With a divine love. Not a self-interested love. A divine love. Because Christ is in them, just like he's in you. Does the Spirit of God in you? Are, do you have peace with God? Do you know that you've been saved? Truly. In your spirit, not in, not because some, you've been convinced of something a preacher told you. Yeah, that's what First John's about. It's not about how to be saved. It's about how do you know that God actually saved you rather than some preacher just pronouncing you saved or some priest.
Yeah, like the the Catholic. You ever watch a been at a Catholic funeral and watch their their mumbo jumbo, and that's what it is. Um, their sprinkling of the the salt and the the does that do anything? No, it doesn't. It's it's called stagecraft. It's to give the priest an aura of power. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is not about Christ at all. No, it has nothing, it has no basis in Scripture. None at all. Now, the chorus here is the atrocious thing. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Okay, not bad. Jesus forsaken. Okay. Jesus forsaken. The Son of Man forsaken. Yeah, you could go there. The problem is this. God, estranged from God. God forsaken by God. Yet one God. We know Jesus is God because John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? What died on the cross? God or the flesh of Jesus? The death of the body. Bought by such love. My life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. But the idea that God, Christ as God was, a, was separated from God the Father. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't tear God in half. Where was the Holy Spirit in this? Well, he would have been by the Father's side, I suppose, because the Holy Spirit wasn't on the cross, was he? except the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It gets confusing really fast. So we, we have this situation. Somebody, and again, this sounds like Paul Washer with his God drank the wrath. Uh, the, uh, Jesus interposed himself between humanity and this angry God and drank God's wrath. Kill me instead. It's like, wait a minute. Salvation was God's idea. Not Jesus, not the Son's idea, but God's idea. The totality of God. And the problem is Christians are unwilling to think and think biblically and examine these things and say, wait a minute, I'm not going to sing that because that is utter poppycock. That is heresy that would historically have gotten you burned at the stake. A pope might have got away with it until he died, and they'd dig his body up and burn it for, as a heretic. They did that with popes for less than this. God estranged from God. That's a denial of the unity of God. That's tritheism there, or bitheism. This, this is, this is or, or Christ was no longer God? Well, that, that would be a heresy. Uh, but it's not... Christ as God who died on the cross. It's Christ the man, the flesh. The word became flesh. Took on a human body and a human mind, a human soul. But Christian theology Orthodox Christian theology has always said, and heresies have always, in this very area, have always been condemned in many different forms. Because this is 
contrary to Trinitarian the, 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 the theology that we have to believe, because even though the Bible doesn't explicitly state it, it's there throughout all of Scripture. How do you have this one God, and the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God? How do you have that? Well, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is where that comes from. Uh, the, it's, necessary. it's a necessary doctrine because it's taught throughout Scripture. And you can't have th this idea. You know, there was a there was a heresy called uh, uh, the, the the well, pa I can't patra passion, passionism that the father suffered on the cross, and they say, like, oh, how can God the Father suffer like suffer pain? He doesn't have a body. Well, Christ had to have a body in order to suffer pain and die. But not, not, so you might, it, you could say God had a body in Christ. But that is not a, a human body because he became a man. But he doesn't have a, a God body. Okay? Okay. It's difficult to talk about these things because they're difficult. Uh, there's, there's things that are very hard to understand. We don't really have, you know, you can take the best theology books you can find and look up the incarnation of Christ and you'll find almost nothing written. Because some people at least have enough wisdom not to go where angels fear to tread. Not so for the author of this, but he's just repeating what he's been in by uh, in been imbibing, which sounds an awful lot like Paul Washer, but not only Paul Washer, uh, Calvinists, uh, Cal the Calvinist types, or people that are influenced by it. As all, they tend to just repeat, not just limited to them, what they've heard from others, without thinking about it. And this is this is abominable. God is strange from God. That, that you can't go there. You simply cannot go to God estranged from God. Uh -uh. So this is, uh, uh, again, this is just one, one song, but this is just like, no, I'm not going to sing that. I know those words are in there now. I don't even, I, I've been debating, should I even stand up for it? But I will not sing it. No, I will not sing that. And the same goes for other songs. If I, I, I'm very unhappy with a lot of the songs in the hymnals. At least they still have hymnals. They only use one, have one song on the projector. Uh, because it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work putting them up there too. And then you have the problems with malfunctions. But uh, hymnals generally don't malfunction. Except when the when they're wrong in print, but there's a lot of things in the hymnals that are uh, Fanny Crosby. Uh, I used to love her. Now I think that, well, she's very man-centered, uh, too much man-centered, uh, and too much uh, well, understandably approaches things from perhaps a feminine point of view. Uh, well, that's one of the problems with churches. That the one of the reasons that often you don't have too many men attending many churches is that they're too. They have an effeminate pastor with the effeminate sermons, and that's another reason that Calvinism uh, had a temporary resurgence. It's uh, and there's been books written on the the feminization of the church uh, and the touchy feely sermons. And that, that is Fanny Crosby, touchy-feely music. Of course, she was a woman, and I believe she was blind. So, uh, yeah, so she's very inward-focused because she can't be exterior-focused when you, when you can't really see the world around you so much. But uh, they, you know, the, the emotions, there's nothing wrong with proper emotions, but they, they should be the consequence of things. Not We shouldn't be in, trying to induce emotions. That's like drugs. 
trying to induce feelings with a chemical. That's not proper. Worshiping Christ in uh, God and <clears throat> in spirit and in truth. Of course, you will have emotions. As you see him more clearly, you should have emotions in response. If you can truly are worshiping and simply be emotionally dead, well, there's something wrong with you. Uh, considering what God has done for us, it should definitely bring forth experience, uh, emotions, but they have to be grounded in truth and in the spirit of God. Not in, and they're simply uh, uh, more superficial. But we should be seeking to, to to more understand God, to understand what He did, and and have a, a spiritual appreciation of God, which is not emotional. Uh, emotions and spirit are two different things. One is high, the highest, and the other is the lowest. Animals have emotions. Uh, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't seek to, which is, this is a sin of evangelicalism and uh, contemporary charismatics, is seeking to draw close to God by working up an emotional state. No, that, that is pagan. That is what pagans did. Or rhythmic music, drumming, repetition. That is how, the, say, the Native Americans used to work themselves into trance states, uh, how uh, shamans worked themselves into trance states, how uh, Hinduism and, and mantras, what it's all about is working yourself into a trance state, an altered state of consciousness, where you're no longer functioning as a human being. Uh, you're no longer consciously aware of things and analyzing things, which is a bad thing, not a good thing. So anything you do that, that degrades what you're supposed to be as a human being, any exercises, anything that, does, that deadens your mind, well, we're supposed to worship, we're supposed to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Isn't that the first and greatest commandment? Isn't that the one that Adam broke, truly? And love your neighbor as yourself. Broke that one, too. If he really loved Eve, he would have said something like, don't eat that fruit. Because the scripture seems to indicate that he was standing right there when all this happened in the garden. So anyway, we need to think biblically. It's uncomfortable to think biblically. It's uncomfortable to listen to sermons sometimes. But if we love God and we love, and we love the brethren, participating in error, participating in false worship, now, who inspires false worship? Because, well, Satan does, because Satan knows that God wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. So if he can get us to worship with emotionalism and call it spirit, or with false uh, ideas and call it uh, truth, well, we're not worshiping God. We're worshiping the liar. We're bowing down to him thinking it's God. Not a good way to worship God, if you care about that. Of course, that's another problem. Uh, the charismatic movement, I would say that most people in a charismatic style, which includes much of evangelicalism now, you know, the, the swaying and the arms and the, the, the droning mantra type music, are simply looking for an experience. They are not truly trying to worship God. Because if they were, they would be concerned about truth. And they'd be disturbed by things like gold glitter coming out of the AC system. Oh, look at a miracle from God. And then somebody looks at it and gathers some up and, you know, this isn't gold. It's like plastic. You'd think they'd care, right? Oh, no, that's, that's lack of faith. You simply don't have faith. God's testing you. You must have faith. 
Yeah, it's not about faith, it's about God. Faith in faith is not worshiping God, as turning faith into an idol, no. Or the prosperity gospel, the name it and claim it, all this stuff. It's all about you having the, your will done rather than God's will done, no. True Christianity is God-centered, not self-centered, not man-centered. True Christianity is. And we need to be aware of where we came from in many ways. And especially if you've been raised in something, uh, you might be blind to what's going on. And we should be, you know, just, just because we've always sung songs doesn't mean we should continue to do that. We should look at them. A pastor's responsibility, the responsibility of the church leadership, is to examine these things and make sure that they are seeking to worship God in spirit and truth and not trying to uh, get the congregation to worship God falsely. Uh, that's why I'm doing this video. I think we should uh, be concerned about that. And I'm talking primarily to pastors. It's your responsibility. It's a responsibility of the congregation, too, but if you're allowing this kind of stuff, if you're allowing, and some people might think I mean nitpicking, but really, God is strange from God? That's not really nitpicking. If you think that's nitpicking, well, you have to go back to the Bible, and you need to learn some basic things about God, including God's insistence that he's one. You can't, how do you have God estranged from God when there's one God? Some sort of psychiatric disorder? Disassociation inside God? Ooh. Then what would happen to the universe? You know, Scripture says that Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. Well, if Christ died as God on the cross, why didn't the universe simply wink out? Because he didn't die as God. He died as the man. The perfect man, the second Adam. And rose. 